Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. We'll begin reading in verse 12, and we'll read to verse 14, and then we'll go down to verse uh, 9, or verse 20. On the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Now if you go down to verse 20, we find in verse 20 the scripture says this, And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. <coughs> Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive. If ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning for the truth that's in the Scripture. And I ask that this morning that you would teach us what you are teaching your disciples. God, we thank you so much that by the help of your Son and through the power of your Holy Spirit, you taught John Mark this important lesson. Lord, I thank you so much that as a result of that, that you inspired this by your word, to be in your perfect uh, scriptures, by them that we might learn today. And I just pray that you would impress upon us great truth about prayer today, about what to pray for and what will hinder our prayers. We pray that you would impress this upon us in a very permanent way in our minds. And Lord, may it be that these are passages of scripture that cause us to believe. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is at the climax of or at, the, I guess, the final part of the popularity of the ministry of our Lord. He has made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and everybody has cried, Hosanna, Hosanna. They recognized him as who he is, the Messiah, the anointed one, the sent one from God, and he's been recognized as Jesus the Christ. And so now from here it is time for him to accomplish what he came to do, and that is what he's been telling his disciples, the Son of Man. Came not to minister, but to be or to be ministered unto, but to minister. And last uh, uh, through the book of Mark, we see that God has impressed upon this particular apostle the importance of being a servant and the importance of what biblical greatness is. Friend, biblical greatness is not being looked at from man and having man say, "There goes a great man" or "There goes a great lady." But biblical greatness is what Jesus said greatness is, and that is that. The one that is, is going to be the chief is going to be the servant of all. And Jesus was the perfect illustration of what greatness was. And it's interesting if you study the passage of Scripture. I was looking at the other day the passage of Scriptures that talk about when Jesus washed his disciples' feet and how that he served them. And Jesus pointed in teaching the disciples uh, that this is what service is. This is what serving is. The conclusion was not... This is how you serve me. The conclusion was, this is how you serve others. One of the hardest things for us to understand in, under, in comprehending being a servant and understanding biblical greatness is that, it's not, uh, is that service is not simply just serving Jesus, but serving God is serving men. Most of the time we say, well, if it were just Jesus, I'd be glad to wash his feet. Well, if it were just Jesus, I would be glad to. But, you know, if I did that, I would have to be serving that person. And he's not worthy to be served. And friend, the one that wants to be chief, the Bible says, let him be your servant. 
And that is, he is speaking specifically of our serving others. And Jesus modeled a perfect example. Well, now he's made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and we have a phenomenon that has happened as well that is in the context of this, in between Jesus and his disciples passing by the way and went afar off seeing a fig tree, coming to it, expecting to find fruit or looking for fruit on it, cursing the fig tree. In between that's happening, we have the, the example of what Christ going into the temple and uh, purging it and purifying it and irritating the, he the Pharisees. I think to understand the character of Jesus, we ought to get to be familiar with Jesus in the temple. And when he came in and he threw out the money changers and he wouldn't allow anyone to carry any kind of a vessel in there and he purified his temple... And uh, if you think that he purified his temple by politely asking those individuals that were uh, defiling the temple to stop doing what they're doing and to consider their actions and love them into doing the right thing, I think you have a misunderstanding of our Lord and the demeanor in which he went into the temple. Uh, he went into the temple and the Bible says he began to cast them out, that soul. In other words, he didn't come in and try to convert them or try to show them they're right. He said, you don't belong here, get out. And then he overthrew the tables of the money changers, and I think it probably made a mess. And he, it, it wasn't one of those things. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. If you were the judge of our Lord in that instance, you'd say he sinned, and he didn't. And so what I want to say is that many times we have an attitude toward wickedness or toward sin, which is different from the attitude of our Savior. And we think that there is some kind of an obligation for Christians to be nice about sin or to be polite about it, or whatever. My friend, I want to just tell you something. Sin's what it is, and it's intolerable, and it, it, it all gets judged. And Jesus had the right to throw the temple, the, those individuals out of the temple. And I'll tell you why. Because he also took upon him the responsibility of going to the cross for the things that they committed. And he, sin is sin, it's wickedness in the eyes of God. And Jesus wasn't ever polite about sin. You say, Pastor, he always... I ate with the publicans and the sinners who came to him for forgiveness, who came for him to find victory over sin. But those individuals that think that they can march into the presence of God in arrogance and in their sin misunderstand the holy character of God and the character of Jesus Christ. I promise you, my friend, that Jesus never had to compromise himself ever to be around publicans and sinners. Publicans and sinners came to Jesus and changed, uh, and, and they came to him and found forgiveness and found victory to change who they were to come into his presence. So there's a conversion process that happens. I don't, I don't want to preach about that this morning. don't want to talk about it, but it's in our context. Now, uh, the, what we do want to look at today is this matter of prayer. And, what, and I want to answer to today the question, two questions. First of all, the question is, what should we pray for in faith? Or what are some things that we ought to pray for? And we'll, we'll look at it from this passage of Scripture. And then we're going to answer the question as well, about what is it that is able to hinder our prayers. And so we'll see both things that we ought to pray for and hindrances to prayer. And I trust, I hope, my prayer about this message is that this passage of Scripture will make an impression in your mind. And it'll make an impression not just in your mind, but it'll become a passage of Scripture that, for which you go to to understand Bible teaching on prayer and one that you go to and claim some very important promises. You know, there are a lot of promises in the Scripture, and I believe that everything that is in the Scripture, all Scripture is profitable, right? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. But are there not some passages of the Scripture in which there are some promises that are to Abraham? Well, there's some profit in those promises for us. Uh, are there not some profit? Is there not better profit, though, in some promises that are to us specifically? And, uh, boy, I'll tell you something. I learn a lot from the promises to Abraham. I can learn about the character of God. I can learn about how to live in light of God's character. But there's something about the male being yours uh, that makes it just not, good, not a good read, but makes it very, very important for application. And this is a passage of Scripture that if you apply it to your life, I don't care, I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care how, what your life experiences are. If you believe what Jesus told his disciples here, evidently they did. If you believe it, it'll be earth shaking. Literally, it'll move mountains in your life. And so I think it's important. So here we are. Jesus, in verse 12, has come to Bethany. And the Bible says he was hungry. And as seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, I'm in verse 13 of Mark 11, he came, if haply, 
and the word haply has to do with chance or opportunity. If haply, he might find anything thereon, and when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. And there is an explanation for why that was. The Bible says, for the time of the figs was not yet. Now, let me just point out some things. I'm not going to preach about this portion of the scripture because this isn't the point. This is the illustration. It's not the point that it illustrated. I've heard messages on cursing the fig tree, and I've heard messages on fruit, you know, on bearing fruit. And if you don't bear fruit, uh, then God's going to curse it, and it's going to wither. And I just want to point out to you uh, this morning that it's not the point of the passage because the passage defines itself. It says what the point is. But I believe that the purpose of, of this passage up to this point is to get the disciples' interest or to make an illustration. Jesus wants to capture their attention so he can tell them something that's incredibly important. You ever been told something really important and you just you just weren't ready for it, you, weren't, you just weren't paying attention, and later on you realize, well, you know, that was really important, but I missed it? Or uh, I do it all the time. I'm, always, I'm one of those kind of people that can carry on a conversation sometimes without being fully engaged. Or I'm engaged in two or three things at the same time. It's not that I'm not listening. I am listening. But uh, I'm also listening to two or three other things. That I don't have, it doesn't have my undivided focused attention. And if I were to say to you, and I were to be able to convince you, that what we're going to say right now is the most important thing you'll ever hear, and it'll change your whole life, it's the sort of thing that you'd say, okay, now what did he just say? He said the most important, it's the most important thing I'll ever hear, and that'll change my life. And the idea of capturing your attention in that way would be to get your undivided attention so that what you'll hear you'll never forget. And so have an application. So I believe, if you'll study this passage of Scripture, I'll just believe it, the passage indicates Jesus says why he cursed the fig tree later on. So here, don't judge the master. Um, he is the one who created the fig tree, and he is the one who is the giver and the taker of life. And don't have an, a problem with God's giving and taking life. He has the right to do so, and he's good to do so. And uh, there's a lot of evidences in the Scripture for it. But the fig tree is not important in this illustration. The disciples, Mark said, that it wasn't the season for the fig tree to produce fruit. So we know why the fig tree didn't produce fruit. It was because it was out of season. Are we agreed on that according to the text this morning? So here comes Jesus, and far off it. Um, the only fig tree I know of in Fort Lauderdale is in front of your house. So if you guys want to go visit Mark and Cassia, what are you having for lunch today? I should ask, did I call you Mark, Bill, and Cass? I'm sorry, I'm thinking of, of Mark, the gospel Mark, but if you want to visit Phil and Cassie, are you fig, they're, they, they're past now, aren't they? They were right there's, a couple weeks. There's a few. They're on, so it's in season. Okay, so they've got a fig tree, and they know what it looks like. Well, uh, maybe you wouldn't be able to spot a fig tree right away, and so we'll um, offer you a poor substitute for it. So here's a fig tree right here, and the fig, ficus, they're the same family. Um, well, maybe they're not. But anyway, we'll pretend it's a fig tree, and it, it'll work fine for the purpose because it doesn't have any fruit on it. Now, let me just ask you a question, Jay. If I were to go to this tree thinking it's a fig tree and supposing it were, supposing it were fashioned like a fig tree and it were a fig tree, and I were to go to it today and try to pluck figs off of it, tell me a reason why I might not find figs on that particular tree. It's artificial. State the obvious. It's artificial. It's not even real. So there's a good reason why I wouldn't find fruit on the fig tree, right? Now, you might, it might capture your attention then if I did something unusual, like being hungry, which I'm not particularly hungry right now, but I can always eat. But uh, seeing that, thinking fig tree, and coming to it and looking for fruit, and then cursing it for not bearing fruit. Saying, no fruit for you from here on out. You say, Pastor, that's pretty likely to happen. Your curse is pretty likely to be fulfilled on that particular fig tree. Well, I won't do it to your fig tree because I don't want to mess it up. They have a fruit-producing <laughs> fig tree. But supposing I were to do that, the disciples would have noticed. It would have made an impression. Why? Why would that have made an impression? If Jesus is walking by, he sees a fig tree, it's not even in season, in it, and he curses it for not producing fruit, why would they, why would they think, what, what would you think if you were with Jesus and he did that? Somebody throw something out there. What would you think? It's unusual. It's unusual. Why is it unusual? Didn't seem to make sense. Yeah, I mean, Jesus. I mean, let's let's give him let's give him the benefit of the doubt. You think Jesus knew the season? Yeah. Anybody here think Jesus? Yeah. Jesus was very aware of time. <laughs> Study the Book of Mark. He was very aware of time, wasn't he? Yeah. I'm going to the cross. 
And here are the days and the events that are going to happen. He's very aware of the time of the year. Time was not something, though Jesus was eternal, it was not something that did not occur to him. We will agree on that this morning. It's unusual uh, that he would even look to the fig tree. It got their attention that Jesus even tried to get fruit from it. Now, the mango season for most trees is not in right now, but the other day, I think it was Eric that was with me, and we went up a, a driveway and there were some mangoes left on a mango tree. And uh, just a couple, but they were out of season. And so we could say that there would be possibility that if it were productive or uh, maybe it's had so much fruit on it that the tree couldn't bear the fruit in season, it might bear some fruit out of season. So we could allow, couldn't we, that there was a possibility for fruit out of season? Could happen. I, I'm not a, a fig tree expert quite yet, but there is a possibility that Jesus went looking for out of season fruit. But the fact is, is that Mark points out it was out of season, so it shouldn't have had fruit on it. So Jesus did what? He cursed it. He said, no more fruit forever. And that poor fig tree got it. I mean, <laughs> Peter is coming back in verse 20. In the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. I mean, you, what, okay, now let me ask you a question. Next day, okay, this, this happened. Let me ask you a question. When a tree starts to die, what's the indication? Where do you see it at? What? Leaf the leaves start falling off, right? Um, or uh, that usually happens in the fall, but have you ever notice a tree that's dying, that the leaves usually don't fall off, they just turn dry and are still on the tree? Like if you cut off a branch off of a tree, you could literally leave the branch and the leaves, I mean, you could shake them off, but they don't just fall off like they do in the fall when a tree is going through a season. Literally, they stay on the branch and... and so you notice it, but what Earl said, you notice it from the leaves. And Peter noticed when he looked at it that this tree was dried up from the root upward. Of course, the root would be the last thing to die. It would be the last thing to lose its life. And the root was dried up, probably even more so than the top. In other words, this thing was completely <clears throat> dead. I mean, just completely dead. Probably every leaf was still on it, dried up, and, but there was no life left in the fig tree. It was completely dead. That's unusual, right? So there's two unusual things. It's unusual that Jesus, who knew everything, would go to a fig tree expecting it to produce fruit out of season. That was unusual. And the second unusual thing was that the tree didn't just die. Now, I've killed plants before. I, and don't think of me unkindly. Um, God doesn't mind us killing plants. We're supposed to have dominion over the earth. And I've even killed weeds. And there are ways of... I'm just telling you, I'm a plant murdering uh, maniac. And if you're alive today, something's died to sustain you. So don't, don't uh, hate on me for it. But I've killed plants. And um, a good way to kill a plant is how? Tack it from the top down? You can. You can spray stuff on the leaves that'll make them lose their ability to do photosynthesis and that sort of thing. But the best way to kill a plant is the roots. Get it from the roots. The point of Peter's noticing this fig is thoroughly dead is that it wasn't dead here or dead there. It was dried up from the roots. In other words, it was completely dead. It was thoroughly cursed, if you will. No remnant of life. And that was Jesus' point. Now, let me just say this. All the sermons I've heard preached from verses 12 to 14, I'll be honest with you, they're not the point. There's all kinds of application about fruit and, that, and so on. You know, if you want to you learn about fruit, go to John 15 or go uh, to the passages that talk about the fruit of the Spirit or talk about the fruits that, are, that belong in a Christian. This is not a passage on fruit for a Christian. This is a passage, and, the, and verses 12 through 14 are for the purpose of getting the disciples' attention, and Jesus succeeded at that. So much so that the next day, Peter, uh, who's a sharp guy, Peter always noticed things. You ever notice that Peter, I mean, we talk about, oh, Peter, well, he didn't know it's, no, Peter was just very astute, he was very observant. He was like, uh, he was just like an, a little child that says what they think, and it's amazing what they notice. They, I mean, just nothing escapes their attention. They hear everything, they see everything, and that's Peter. I mean, he just doesn't miss I, uh, I wink. If it were you or me, the day before, we'd have said, well, Jesus did something weird, and then it would have just gone right out of our mind. But Peter saw it, and he said, Jesus, 
the fig tree which you cursed. Now, it's also interesting, if you'll notice, when Jesus cursed the fig tree, that he didn't, the disciples saw him, the Bible said. Uh, but it doesn't say, uh, it doesn't say that he said anything to them about it. It's just, uh, he, no man eat fruit of the hereafter, and his disciples heard it. So Jesus did on purpose something that was different, or something that was out of the ordinary, and he offered no commentary on it, didn't? Didn't say, watch what I'm going to do here and curse the fig tree. No, he and the fig tree had a personal dialogue, but the disciples were spying. They were watching, and they observed. That's really strange. What he just did there was very strange. Jesus didn't do, just do strange things because, you know, he thought it would be funny to see the reaction. Now, there are, this is a form of humor, doing strange things to watch other people's reaction. It's a form of humor that I delight in. I don't mind doing something a little out of the ordinary just to watch people go, what in the world? Has he gone nuts? Has he gone kooky? And I have more fun watching you think that I'm kooky than you have thinking that I'm kooky. And so I can understand that, but that isn't what Jesus was doing here. He wasn't wasting time. His time was very limited. And he wanted his disciples to understand something that would have an impact and change their lives. And so he does something out of the ordinary, and it's a wonderful way to capture someone's attention. I've been in church services where people did things out of the ordinary. When I went to college in Pensacola, uh, Dr. Shetler was the pastor at that time, and he would always do something that got people's attention. I remember one time, uh, he comes up to the pulpit, and he announces the text, and all of a sudden he says, Jeff Redland, come on down! And uh, if you knew who Jeff Redland was, he was a youth pastor at the time. He was just a nut. And he just leaps out of his chair, like in a, in a crowd of you know over 5,000 people. And he leaps out of his chair and is like, woo yeah! And he's like dancing down the aisles and jumping around and smiling and waving, you know, and high-fiving everybody. And runs up to the pulpit. And if you knew that, you know, it just that was unusual. And the reason is he was going to capture our attention. I remember the illustration. I don't remember what the message was about, but it got my attention. <laughs> there, there was another time that happened, though. One time when I was in, in Christian college, I was sitting in the dining room. There were two services because there was too large a crowd to fit in the auditorium. And there was an early morning service, and there was a, the Sunday school between and the later service so that they could accommodate everyone. And I had gone to the early morning service, gone to Sunday school, and was sitting in the uh, dining hall looking out the window, and a man comes racing out of the auditorium, and uh, a couple men in suits are chasing him. He goes racing uh, to leave the campus, and they shut the gates down. And what had happened was that a man stood up, uh, Pastor Shetler announced his text, and a man stood up in the balcony and said, Thus saith the Lord! Let the women keep silence in the churches. And a lady had just sung a special right before that and in the church, and so he pronounced judgment on them from the balcony. And everybody thought Pastor Shetler set this up so that he can <laughs> preach about whether or not it's appropriate for ladies to sing in church. And we're going to look at the Bible. But the fact is that Pastor Shetler didn't set it up, and Pastor Shetler looked up and he says, I did not do this. This is not something And then everybody took off after the guy, and, and they got him, and so <laughs> Anyway, so, uh, but uh, the, my point is, is there are things that we do sometimes that get attention, right? And Jesus is getting his disciples' attention by doing something unusual here, and that is all that is happening in Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 14. But it is not all that is happening. He is not wasting time. He wants to get a very important point across. And friend, if you go away from here today and you think that Jesus was talking about fig trees and talking about fruit, you've missed the point, and if you missed the point... You'll never have the promise. You'll never get what Jesus wants us to get here. So let's look at uh, the, the point. The point that Jesus was trying to make is that if you ask God for anything in faith, that God can do it. That's the point. So let me just go ahead and state the point this morning. Uh, and now, now think about it this way. Could not Jesus have been walking on his way uh, to or from Bethany and said to his disciples, if you ask God anything in faith, he'll do it. That's the sort of thing you expect Jesus to talk about all the time. His disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. But Jesus wanted to make a point that God can do anything and that he will do anything in answer to prayer. And there's some qualifications for the prayer. And Jesus is going to teach his disciples. But it's very important that the disciples know God's ability to answer prayer. It's very important. It's so important that Jesus does something unusual to capture or captivate their attention. And I think it's an unusual enough event that we ought to say, okay, 
This is important enough that Jesus does something unusual to illustrate the point, and so let's pay attention. Are we there? All right, let's make a couple points. It won't take very long to get it. Verse 21, Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold. So, Jesus, look. Here's Jesus walking away, or walking along. They're on the way back from where they come from. And Peter said, Jesus, look. The fig tree that you cursed, he said, is withered away. Jesus was not surprised about the fig tree. He cursed the fig tree. He called on God to destroy that fig tree and to cause it never to bear fruit again. And he didn't ever have to go back and check on it to know God did. In other words, Jesus knew how to pray and his disciples knew he knew how to pray. But it surprised his disciples. It surprised them. Now, I would submit to you this morning, it surprised them for a couple of reasons. First of all, from their minds and from our minds, there's no good reason why that fig tree should have been cursed. Right? Let's be honest about it. You know, we're not passing judgment on, on, on Jesus. There, there was no good reason why it should have been cursed to begin with. And to us, there would be no good reason why it got, why it actually happened. And I, I just say this, the disciples were surprised that it happened. In other words, they called it, in other words, if they had just believed, well, Jesus cursed the fig tree, that's the end of that rascal. And that fig tree will never produce fruit again. Now, if you asked them, do you believe that that fig tree will ever produce fruit again? Probably the answer would be, no, it's, it's probably cursed. But the fact is, is that when they passed by and it was cursed, it surprised them so much that they told Jesus, look what happened when you fig cursed the fig tree. And it surprised them. And Jesus wanted them to understand something, and that is that God is predictable enough when asked that it's no surprise when prayer is answered. The point that Jesus wanted his disciples to get is that God is predictable enough when asked that there is no surprise when he answers prayer. Have you ever asked God a just-in-case prayer? God, I think they're going to die from cancer. But if you want to, you can heal them, so if you want to, go ahead. You ever ask God for something knowing in faith that it's what he wants you to ask? Hey, listen, friend, before you ever ask God to heal, get settled on whether or not he wants to. Is it always God's will to heal? The answer is no. The Bible's plain about it. It's not always God's will. So sometimes God wants people to die. And it's not bad. It's not evil. It's good. And I'm telling you, if God wants me to go to heaven, don't pray for him to heal me. Right? I mean, I, I, the, the rapture is the mode I, I am looking for. But the fact is that if God wants me to die, then... Don't pray for me, not for him not to take me. I always look at the illustration of Lazarus, and I know why Jesus healed Lazarus. But I look at poor Lazarus getting getting called back, and I feel sorry for the boy. I just think, man, Lazarus didn't want all that. He was glad his body was rotten. He said, I don't need it anymore. I'm clothed with a temporary one. I'm just fine where I'm at. And then he had to come back. And I always think... I, I, I'd have a lot of questions for Lazarus. I could ask him questions all day long. What was it like to be in paradise and get called back? <laughs> you know, how did you feel? You know, obviously, God, he was glad to be used of God. He was glad for the opportunity. I guarantee you he lived the rest of his life differently. But church history tells us that Lazarus was killed. Cruelly killed. You just think, you know, the way he went the first time he got sick and died, it was, it was much better. But God had a plan for him. But I'm just telling you something, if, if it's God's will for me to die, I'll be honest with you, I don't think I'd pray to live. Don't pray, think I pray, please don't pray for me to live. Come ask me before you ask about it, for God to do it. And Jesus points out to his disciples that their problem, or that the point of everything is, in a couple of words here, the point is, have faith in God. 
Have faith in God. Jesus answered. Peter said, Master, look, the fig tree that thou cursest is withered. And Jesus said, Have faith in God. And that was his point. Have faith in God. Friend, you and I have an obligation to exercise faith. You say, I, I, I can't do it. I don't have the faith. We're told to. We're told to. And Jesus says to his disciples, this is an action statement, have faith in God. In other words, believe God. God who? God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. When Jesus cursed the fig tree, God cursed the fig tree. Jesus was God. So in telling Peter and the disciples to have faith in God, Jesus is saying, have faith in me, have faith in my Father, and have faith in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. It's a simple statement, and yet you could, you could write a dissertation on it. You could write books and volumes about the statement, have faith in God, and the implications of it, what it meant. But obviously, Jesus says to Peter, the point is... Peter, it appears as Jesus, look, you, it, it died. And Jesus said, the point is, have faith in God. And he had everybody's attention at that point. And now he's going to say, this is what I want you to know. I want you to know you're supposed to have faith in God. That is a stand-alone command that if practiced, and if we had the rest of the Scripture not there, it needs no qualification. But specifically, the area that Jesus wants the disciples to have faith in God is in the area of prayer. Because he qualifies his statement. Verse 23. For truly, for verily, I say unto you, that whosoever... Oh, i got to be a prayer warrior. What's a prayer warrior? Where do, we, where do we get that from anyway? Is that, is that a Bible term or something? I, I think it's an 80s buzzword or an 80s slogan. And to call, have your prayer warriors pray. Well, who's the prayer warrior? Who can be a prayer warrior? Verse 23 says that whosoever. Whosoever. Who can be a prayer warrior? And the answer is any old pastor, an unsaved person couldn't. An unsaved person is a whosoever. An unsaved person can say, God, I'm asking you to save me because of Jesus Christ. This is an evangelistic verse. When you're lost, God wants to answer your prayer and can answer your prayer. And if you'll have faith in him, say, God, I'm trusting you to save me because of what Jesus did when he died on the cross for my sins. You'll be included with the people that could curse a fig tree. There's no exclusion. My, I'm not, don't, don't look at me and say, Pastor, this is not a verse on evangelism. This is not a verse on whosoever will can come to Jesus. That's not the point. Listen, my point is that whosoever is all-inclusive and that no one is excluded with regard to praying and asking God and being able to get answers. So even if a person were lost, he's a whosoever, and he could come to Christ, and God would answer his prayer. Anyone, my friend, can pray and have God answer their prayer. So when Jesus makes a statement, have faith in God, he is not saying, you guys that are going to be head and shoulders above the rest in the area of prayer, have faith in God. He is not saying, you individuals that have uh, passed the age of profitability physically and can only stay home and pray, have faith in God. Yeah, isn't it funny that we think that only the elderly can be can pray and have great answer to prayer? Isn't it not true that, that uh, many of us have seen great examples of prayer in the elderly? I have. Well, I've had elderly ladies in particular that pray for me. I have elderly men that pray for me every day. And God answers their prayers. And I'm just, God has spared me, has protected me, has, has delivered me, has prepared me, has done marvelous things in answer to prayer of the elderly, but I want to point out to you that whosoever is not an elderly only verse. Listen, you can pray before you can't do anything else. It's good for us sometimes to know we can't do anything, so we'll pray. 
Sometimes it's good for us to lose some capacity so that we don't think that we are profitable without needing God. And the reason we pray, my friend, is because we need God, and it's a whosoever verse. It includes everybody. It includes the child. It includes the middle-ager. It includes the elderly. It's an inclusive verse and excludes no one. God calls us to have faith in Him and to ask Him. Have faith in God. Uh, verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Yes, pastor, but if God's going to move a mountain, there better be a reason for it. You better know it's his will. The verse doesn't say that. That's what we say to explain why we don't pray and ask God to move mountains. The fig tree was out of season, my friend. There was no reason it should produce fruit. And Jesus was not threatened by the existence of the fig tree, and so he cursed it. He cursed it simply to illustrate that God answers prayer. And it might be that in your life you need a mountain move just so God knows you, he, so that you can know God answers prayer. Pastor, you know, I mean, it's more practical than that. Friend, there's nothing more practical than having faith in God and asking God to do the impossible. There's nothing more practical than having faith in God and asking God to do the impossible. Well, I don't think we ought to waste God's time in heaven just praying and asking for this to be done and that to be done and so forth. I'm not arguing that we need to pray frivolous prayers this morning. But if you go away saying the point of the passage is don't pray frivolous prayers, you've missed the point again. What's the point of our passage? Have faith in God. That's the point of the passage. And Jesus said that if any one of you had faith, any of you, if whosoever, anybody in the world had enough faith, they could pray that this mountain would be moved from here, thrown into the sea, and it would be done. And in this verse, he is talking about the capability of God. He says, have faith in God because God can do anything. You know, I think that many times when we pray, we think that God can't do anything. You say, you, no, pastor, I believe God can do anything. Well, that's what you say you believe. When's the last time you cursed a fig tree? And I'm not saying you should go by Bill and Cassius' house. That wouldn't be nice. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking you the last time you asked God to do the impossible so you could see him do the impossible. What could God do? Answer it one word. What can God do? Anything. Yes. What can God do? Anything. What can God do? Anything. 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 And we always qualify with anything he wants to. <clears throat> you know, God can do anything we want him to. He's not just limited by what he wants to do. But he could actually do something we want him to do. He's not our slave. He's not a genie in a bottle. He's just that big. He's big enough that he's not threatened by doing man's will. 1 John chapter 5 says, If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Friend, the point of that passage is not that you have to pray according to God's will. The point of that passage is that if you ask God to be saved and he wants you to be, then he will. In other words, that passage says, God wants you to be saved and if you ask him, he'll do it. This passage says you can ask God for anything and he'll do it. There's no qualification for that. The qualification is faith. The qualification is faith. What is it that you think would be wrong to ask God for because it might be something that you want or desire? Well, I couldn't ask God for that. Is it, is it wrong? Is it sin? Would it be sin to ask God for it? Well, I mean, it's kind of for me. So it'd be kind of like cursing a fig tree for the sake of illustration. Friend, it is a lie 
that God in heaven will not answer your prayers because he doesn't want to, even though you want him to. Just because he doesn't want something that you want. Is it true that you and I can want something that God doesn't want us to have? Is it true? Friend, absolutely. Don't ask God for things you know he doesn't want. But there might not be anything wrong with cursing a fig tree for an illustration. Do you see the point this morning? We've made so many qualifications that take away all the power of God to do anything, even what we want. And we've neutralized the Scripture. So much so that in our heads we say God can do anything, but we'll never pray and ask Him to, because we don't think He wants to. That's bad theology. Doesn't jive with the scripture. Doesn't work. And then Jesus said, Therefore, here's the conclusion I say unto you, what things soever ye desire. What's the qualification for will here? Fellow, I wish, I will, I desire, I want. That's what that word means. I wish, I desire, I want. It's my it's my will. Whatsoever things ye desire. That's what the verse says. I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel to you this morning, but friend, if you want to be financially secure, don't you think you could ask God for it? Pastor, are you becoming one of those? No, I am a believer in God's ability to do what he wants to. Mm-hmm. You could ask God to take care of your finances. Well, I don't think we should pray for something like that. I think you could. But if you don't think you should, I promise you something he won't. He's not going to make you rich to prove it's his will. I know that's, I, I'm not telling anyone here this morning to pray to be rich. But you're, you're allowed to. You're allowed to. Hey, what is the proverb on that? Lord, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Maybe it might be that your poverty is a struggle for you. It might be that your riches are a struggle for you. There are those that are rich that have a desire to not be rich. Could they ask God to just remove their riches and put them in a situation where they don't have to deal with that anymore? I'm telling you, you can ask God for anything. And that's what the passage of Scripture says. Could God heal? The Bible indicates that he can and he does. And I've seen him do it. Friend, you just ask yourself, is this what God wants in my life? And sometimes the only answer you'll have is, I want to live. I want to be well. I want to be healed. Well, if you want to be, live and be well and be healed, then my recommendation is ask God to heal you. That's why I told you, come ask me. If I want to be healed, that's an answer to whether or not I should pray it. I've had people call me before and say, pray for me to be healed. You know what I do? I ask God to heal them. Why? Because he'll do it. That's the requirement. That's the standard. It's not some kind of mystical, you know, well, let's, here's an equation we've got to go through and you've got... 24 questions for brother so-and-so in order to know whether or not, you know, it's God's will to heal him. It's a one-question issue. You have faith in God? There is a bit of a qualification. Let's look at that. Verse 25, when you stand praying, forgive, if you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. The qualification is that you cannot stand before God in trespasses. You cannot stand before God in sin and pray prayer of faith. Let me just tell you something. Having faith in God and having sin in your life are an oxymoron. You don't do both at the same time. In other words, when you demonstrate faith, you demonstrate faith by saying, God, I believe that the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient to cleanse my sin. I believe it's sin, and I'm asking you to forgive it. 
asking God for forgiveness is a demonstration of faith. And a specific sin that would hinder God from answering our prayer is unforgiveness. I mean, just God just points out, if you're unforgiving, you're not going to be able to pray in faith. And now, I wouldn't go so far this morning as to say that this is just a summary. Unforgiveness is a summary of all sin. I would say that the passage of Scripture is very specific about what, God, what will keep God from answering your prayer, and that is unforgiveness. What is unforgiveness? What is unforgiveness defined? It is the unwillingness to release someone else of debt. Unforgiveness is an unwillingness to release someone else of debt, whether they owe you or you simply perceive that they owe you. It is an unwillingness to release debt. Forgiveness in this context, in the understanding of the disciples, would have understood it. Forgiveness is debt owed being released by the one owed. And how many of us have forgiven in that way? How many of us have been wronged, and when someone has wronged us, they have owed us a debt? I would submit to you that if you're human, someone's wronged you. And that necessitates you forgiving them. If you're going to have faith in God, it's the answer to prayer. You cannot harbor unforgiveness. Another word for it is bitterness. You cannot harbor unforgiveness in your life at all. And have faith in God and see God move mountains. It's impossible. You can't do it. Jesus said, if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. What does that mean? Does it mean you're not saved? Is Jesus talking about salvation here? What is Jesus talking about? That's our context. A little statement we've been saying over and over. Have faith in God. And if you stand before God with unforgiveness in your heart, you stand before God owing a debt when you ask God to answer your prayer. And the simple answer, the, the simple explanation here is that God won't answer prayer to a heart that's unforgiving. Let me ask you a question. Your spouse, what they did, they deserve to pay for. Did you release them of the debt? Did you release them of the debt? They should pay. They should have to pay. They will. But they don't owe you. Did you release them of the debt? I am telling you they did it to me and they should have to. They should. But their debt's with God, not with you. And you can hold a mortgage if you want to. You can hold a note against anybody for anything. And I'll tell you the only thing that will happen is God will say there's unforgiven, there, there's unforgiven debt here. I won't answer your prayer. Who has the right to forgive? God. Why does God forgive? Because we're sorry? Why can God forgive? Because of Christ. God can forgive because of the unmatchless, unlimited love of Jesus Christ demonstrated through us, to us, on the cross. And if you're holding dead out there, it doesn't belong to you. It's not yours. You can't forgive it. You can't receive payment for it. It's not owed you. See, a trespass, my friend, sin. A trespass is sin. It's, it's something that's done against. And sin's not against you. It's against God. Stop putting yourself and your, the, your feelings and your hurt, which are legitimate, which you have. Take yourself out of the situation and just get real about it. It's not about you. When somebody sinned, 
their payment for that sin is not going to be to you. Never will. You'll never get paid for somebody's trespasses against you. The only way that the trespasses against you could be made right is if they'd never done it. It's the only way. But when it's happened, my friend, you can't make it go away. There's only one way to make things go away. And that's payment. And nobody can pay you. I'm just telling you. I'm telling you what you want from that person that hurt you so badly is not to be healed. They can't heal you. Stick a knife and don't do it. But stick a knife in somebody. Stick it in yourself. No, don't do that either. People do strange things. You've got to watch what tell people do. If you stuck a knife in someone and asked forgiveness, there'd still be a cut. There'd still be a wound. If you stuck a knife in someone and desired forgiveness, there'd still be a cut. There'd still be a wound. You can't make it go away. And even when it heals, there'll be a scar. But the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. The only place anyone can find forgiveness is not from you. They can't do it. Listen, you can forgive because of Christ, friend. But if you demand payment for the debt, can I tell you that it is impossible to be paid? Your wound cannot be healed by the person who inflicted it. Mama can't kiss it and make it better. There's only one thing that can heal, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. Only one place to find forgiveness. And do you know where they need to find forgiveness? Not from you. I need his forgiveness. I won't. You might never get their forgiveness. And even if they forgave you, it wouldn't heal what you did to them. And it's high time we as Christians understood that harboring unforgiveness will never cause our debt to be paid. You know what your unforgiveness means? You know what it really means? I hate. Unforgiveness is harbored hatred. That's what it is. It is, I want them dead. It's not that you want it all to go away and never to have happened. It is that you are angry and that you're bitter and you want them to suffer. In other words, you want them to be wounded for your wound. That's what unforgiveness is. Well, I won't forgive them until they've had some consequences. I won't forgive them until they're truly... Oh, listen, how can they prove they're truly sorry? I'll tell you how they could die a miserable, painful death as a consequence of what they did to you so it would be directly related and they'd know as they went into eternity that they're dying because of what they did when they hurt you. You wouldn't forgive them. You'd be happy they died. You understand what unforgiveness is? It's hatred. It's a desire for judgment. Let me remind you about something. There has never been a person on this earth who has ever committed any sin against anybody that has gone unjudged. Those who have not yet been judged will stand in judgment. All sin is judged. But you're not going to be sitting on the judgment seat when they're judged. God will. And when you stand before holy God in heaven, and you make it to heaven, it'll be because your sin was judged on the cross of Jesus Christ. And God forgave you because your debt was paid in full by the precious Lamb who made atonement for your soul. And that's forgiveness. Debt paid. I want to remind you, friend, that if you have your prayers unhindered because of unforgiveness, first of all, your debt will never be paid. The debt that you believe you're owed can't be paid. It can't be. Hey, you couldn't forgive. You don't even have the right. Because you can't make it go away. 
You know what the forgiveness of Christ did? You know what the work of the cross accomplished? It made us justified, righteous. This statement many individuals use, which is fine to describe justification, is just as if I'd never sinned. Literally, the word means righteous. <laughs> Made righteous. Made what Jesus is because he became what we were without ever sinning. And God forgives us. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it great to be forgiven? There's two points, really one point, that Jesus wanted to make, but there's a qualification for it. The point is, is that you're supposed to have faith in God. If you have faith in God, you'll ask God to do mighty things and you'll see answer to prayer because God can do absolutely anything, but there's one qualification. And the qualification is that if you harbor unforgiveness, your debt that you perceive you are owed cannot be paid anyway. But you'll suffer the consequence of not being able to have forgiveness before God so that he can answer prayer. And it might be this morning, friend, that you're powerless with regard to answer to prayer. And you say, oh, pastor, no, God did this or he did this. You know what? Your answers to prayer many times are coincidental. I, I'm not trying to take away from you. God's doing supernatural things. But when God does it, you know it. And the fact is that many times what we call answer to prayer, it's just like, well, what a neat coincidence. I mean, and we honestly don't, I mean, unsaved people could testify of the same kind of coincidence that we say is answer to prayer. And not very often do we curse a fig tree and walk by the next day and it's gone, dead. Not many times do we ask God for supernatural healing that no man can take credit for and receive it. Not many times do we ask God to change our situation 100% utterly, believing that He can, and He does it. I just would submit to you, Christian, that if God answered prayer the way the Bible says He wants to, and you were seeing it because there was forgiveness in your life, and you had nothing to hinder it, and you were praying, you'd have nothing to whine about. How many times do you say, Pastor, this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. Don't, don't, don't worry about coming to me and asking me to pray and ask God to do things in your life. But how many times do we as Christians just, I mean, well, I'm pretty good, but, but not really as good as I could be because of the circumstances that are in my life that are not ideal. I'll tell you why there's circumstances in your life that are not ideal. It's in Mark chapter 11. It's one of the qualifications to praying in faith. I'll tell you why God hasn't answered your prayer and why He hasn't done things that are obviously of God. Why you haven't seen mighty works from God. It's because of Mark chapter 11. It is not because God cannot. It's not because God doesn't want you to have what you want. It's not because it is because you do not have faith in God. It's because you don't have faith in God. And there's some qualifications for it. And the qualification is unforgiveness. Let me just ask you a question this morning as we conclude. First question is this. I was saying this morning where he leads, I'll follow. And while we were singing that, I was wondering, I wonder if all of us followed Jesus last week. I wonder if every place we were last week was where Jesus led us. Could you testify this morning that there was not a single word that escaped your lips, not a single place that you where your foot trod that Jesus didn't lead? Where he leads, I'll follow, follow all the way. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow Jesus every day. Seven days we're in last week from the last time we met here on a Sunday morning. Did you follow Jesus all week last week? Would Jesus say you followed him all last week? Every step of the way, every word? Were you where Jesus wanted you to be every time last week? All the time? Well, it's not honest to say that if we don't practice it. How do you know that sometimes having faith in God has to do with following Jesus? Seeing God work and asking God to do things. Much of the time, one of the things that hinders us from following Jesus is the desires of our heart. It is our wanting to be paid a debt that we do not owe. Let me ask you this morning this. Is there anybody... 
who you haven't forgiven? Is there anybody in your life to whom you harbor unforgiveness? It's pretty easy to know when you see them. You don't want to talk to them. You resent everything they say, everything they think, everything they do, and have fellowship with them. Why? They owe me a debt. They can't pay it. And the only way for them to ever be right with you, from your perspective, is for you to go ahead and let God forgive them so that you can have forgiveness. Now, I just want to tell you something this morning, Christian. You'll be powerless. You'll never see God answer prayer. You won't see it. You'll never see a mountain moved. The lost will never be able to, they'll never believe you. You ever testified of God doing something and lost people didn't believe it? You ever had a lost person skeptical of what God did? Sure. You know why? There are some things that are undeniable and that silence even the heathen. Those are acts of God. You ever see the wicked silence? I've seen it sometimes. I've seen people just that had everything to say. I've seen their mouth closed. So they thought, you know what, I just better not say it. I look like even worse of a fool. You know, if you saw answer to prayer, the heathen wouldn't be able to say it was anything else. That's impossible. With God, all things are possible. And they couldn't say anything. That's what God wants us to see. It might be a fig tree. It might be a mountain. It might be a job. It might be a relationship. Ask God. Have faith in God. Heavenly Father, help us to have faith in you. Help us to believe you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have an invitation.